So Jaffest, that's the biggest show of the year. Not only was it our finale, it was Driftmasters European Championship finale, and it was my finale as an organizer of Irish Drift events. So that's a lot of pressure on one event. And I went to Mandelo Park and I said, look, it's my last event. We haven't had a really good year, but I need one big gambler from you guys. And they were amazing. They said, look, put it to me what you want and uh, we'll see if we can make it happen. So I said, I want to go back to the Global Warfare layout, the layout that made Irish Drifting so famous, put us on the map. I want to add in a roundabout, which I thought was awesome from other events we'd done during the year. I needed tarmac laid. I needed hundreds of meters of cables run. I needed two massive grandstands. I needed two screens. I passed that sheet across the table in Mandela Park and expected to get maybe 50% back. And they just said, do you think it'll work? I said, I think it'll work. And they gave me everything. So we were ready to put a massive, massive show on. And for the boys building that track, that was over a week build. It was the biggest build we'd ever done for an event. And it was going to be do or die, the last event, the last throw of the dice, and all the pieces of the puzzle were there. So I was absolutely crazy hyped, nervous even, going into that last event. I think it's very fitting that it was my last event filming on this layout for Jetfest because it was my first IDC event that I'd ever gone to, Global Warfare 1. I have to say, at that event, I fell in love with Irish Drifting. Like, I'd been doing BDC for two years prior to that, and it was honestly the 10 step ups. It was the most exciting thing I think I'd ever seen. I couldn't take, like, that's where I think I became a fan. Before it was a job to me, and that's when I really became a fan. Like, every single run was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. I almost, like, stopped filming some runs just so I could watch myself. Like, it was honestly, it was a special moment to see that track come back after it was told it was never getting. It was our finale of the championship, my finale as a drift organizer in Ireland. You couldn't ask for more pressure and you could feel that pressure right throughout the grid as they were getting ready for this one. This was the last round of the season, break the car, who cares? If you're gonna make a name for yourself, this was the place to do it in front of the biggest crowd we've ever had. And there was no time for backing down now. They knew the track was dangerous, but you had to go out there, put the fear to the side, you know, throw it in at 60, 70 mile an hour and say, right, this is my time. And boy, did those boys hit the track hard. It was incredible. So with it being such a dangerous track, we took as many precautions as we could. Uh, we changed up the barriers. We used to use concrete ones in that layout, swapped them for the steel uh, barriers from Dunleary and Punchestown. We also added a secondary wall on initiation, just so it deflected the cars away from the grass. Scares the absolute shit out of me, to be honest. <laughs> We're coming into that wall at 80 miles an hour. Of course it's scary. Pulling first, second, third gear, straight onto a wall is just nothing that I've done before. The way the track is so dangerous, it's like it brings that like proper adrenaline rush to your body. Like you know, you're like when you're on the handbrake flicking in, you're like, oh man, this could go all wrong. And like you know, you're on the perfect line when like you clinch your buck cheeks and you're like, Whoa! it's unbelievable. Yeah, I need to rip out a few brain cells and throw them out the window when you're heading towards that wall. I initiated a bit late, thinking I'd rub the wall and I misjudged it completely. I was actually quite happy with the track this morning in my practice. I was going pretty well. Yeah, I was pretty confident. Maybe a little bit more confident than I should have been. 
I know exactly how it feels to be up in the back of the recovery truck with the car absolutely mangled and going back into the pits to the lads. It's not a nice feeling and to see yet another car come in on the back of the recovery truck scary me a little bit. The track team are very, very good at responding to them. But just with this event, everyone had to be that little bit more prepared. We had extra bodies on the track. You know, we had cranes ready to fix walls. We had spare walls ready to be dropped in if there was any damage, just to keep the show on the road. But even some of the best drivers couldn't keep away from that wall. Alan Hines crashes badly into the wall in his last run of practice. As a promoter, your dream is to have your two biggest stars, you know, going for that championship all the way down to the final moments. And then in a, in a heartbeat, it's done. He's in the wall, car's wrecked, and that's it. You know, you think this big championship fight, it's gonna end like this. After all the fight that Alan had put in all year, it's, it's heartbreaking to watch. The car is destroyed. Uh, front, every single corner is bent, uh, unrepairable for today at least. We gotta keep the show on the road. And during qualifying, we start hearing some rumors and I genuinely, genuinely couldn't believe them. Basically, uh, Alan Hines had uh, an accident in practice this morning where the car wasn't fixable. I hate seeing anybody going out to the championship like that, so I, there was only one thing to do. I, like, I tried my best to find him another car because I'm also in the championship fight. I was not going like, to let that happen. Like, if worst came to worst and he wasn't going to get a car, I was going to give him my car, which I did. Hopefully he can do what he needs to do and the car does, it, does the business for him. Just think about it. Dwayne McKeever is going for a European Championship the next day. All he needs to be in the fight is his car working perfectly. And he decides to give his car to someone who's in another championship the day before that could even throw away his European Championship. That to me sums up drifting. And that sums up how much never say die attitude there is in that pits. Yeah, we're not going to give up just yet. We're going to try and get this championship and uh, yeah, we'll see how we get on. Look at this, I cannot believe what I'm seeing here from the off. Alan Hines is sitting in Dwayne McKeever's European drift car. For Alan Hines to go back out into the fight in Dwayne McKeever's car, in the car that has been the rival of Jack Shanahan for so many years, I mean, you couldn't write it. Look at the entry onto the wall from Hines, as Alan Hines goes right to the wall on his first ever lap in this car. He's never driven an RB, he's never driven this chassis, and he's never driven with this steering. So it's all brand new for Alan Hines, but he drops off the track, barely keeps two wheels on it. As he tries to learn this car in one lap on one of the most dangerous tracks in the history of Irish drifting, with a very nervous Dwayne McKeever sitting somewhere in the grandstand saying, go out there and don't let the championship be lost in qualifying. And what a run from Alan Hines. You know what, Dave? In the past, we have lied and said that this is the first run that this person has ever done in this car, whereas they may have done a practice one. He has never, ever driven that car before. That is phenomenal. Because it's just started raining. The dynamic of rain versus having done all your track time in the dry is significant. First of all, when it's dry, we put a lot of rubber down, which means as soon as you get it wet, it turns into ice effectively. In fact, it's probably even worse than ice because it's patchy in different areas. It means that you go out there completely unaware as to what the track conditions are. And because the battles are so tight, you have to fully commit behind the lead driver. If he goes in the wall, you go in the wall and you hit him as well. If you ease off and he doesn't hit the wall, even though you think he is, he's gonna create a massive gap and then you've lost. So it is 100% commitment the entire time without knowing what the conditions of the surfers are like. And I would have made a reference to, at the first round, there's like a band going on tour almost. This is the final event. This is the final showing. And this is where everybody at the end of the year put everything on the line, more so than any time before, based on the fact that they know they've got all winter to fix the car. So this is the last big event that we've got. This is probably the last big event that we're gonna have here for quite some time by the sounds of it. And so everybody's here to prove a point. on a nice line, but he's unable to shake the tail of Lee Scott. And Oliver Evans is just equal to everything that Wes Keating throws out of here. Side by side, both of them are now, they almost make contact. Alfred looks so steady out on circuit, but do not put anything past Paul McCarthy. He's trying to get on the door, but if it looks he's very, very wide there. 
Shanahan looking absolutely dull right now. Hines pops the wheel up onto the curb. Alan Hines advances through. He goes fast into that front corner. Oh, yeah. Wow. You'll always hear me talk about how different um, drifting, especially Irish drifting, is, is to every other motorsport. And I think that was really shown in what happened to one of the drivers that we had given a wild card to the event. So Niall Murray, he's won everything when it comes to professional motorsport, you know, single seaters, touring cars, that kind of stuff. And he's from a different world. But the last world he wanted to conquer was drifting. And I think for good or for bad, it wasn't what he expected. The last battle in the first bracket of our top 32, Niall Murray qualifying up the order in fifth position. Oh, big contact, contact. Oh, and big, big contact. into the wall, would you believe it? He was put into the wall hard. It was a very, very, very heavy impact. Like I remember seeing that car go up in the truck and I was like, it's not coming back out. I've seen a lot of cars go into the pits and not come back already that day. And I thought that was another one. Basically, what you want to do is your, uh, your sash is already bent. So instead of fucking trying to knock it in, your steering's going to be off. We're going to use the slightly bent voice back and then track it the way it should try to be. Yeah. And you're already a 10-0 when you're Yeah, track. I know, yeah. Here we are, 24th banner. You just have about 3-4 minutes max, lads. When you go back out, man, it'll be not nice to drive. I know, yeah. But literally, stay behind them. It doesn't matter if you make pressure, just go and score a 10-0. Yeah. You're true to the top 15 when it comes back in, a line on top of stuff. Oh, thanks, thanks, William. You may get Wayne to have a quick check in this because there's a few little dodgy things been done here, right? Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Right, he's moving here. Murray's moving there now. He's done. Well, it looks like he's looking confident. You know, he, again, another driver sitting with points in the bag right now. And Canal Murray get himself in to his first pro event top 16. Here we go as they fire down. The grip levels changed since the last time. That's oh, that's a big wow. crash into the wall. Oh, both, both guys, cars. both guys wow. into the wall. Just make it official yeah. and all judges in favour of Niall Murray. The fact that the entire drift community, again, even to an outsider, you know, someone that had only just come in, that they would get under his car, fix his car and get him back onto the track when even he'd given up on it. I mean, he was running around the pits <laughs> asking people who to pay, who, who, who did he owe money to? And people were laughing at him saying that's not how it works around here. And that sort of stuff makes me very proud to be a part of the Irish drift community, that they're so selfless to anybody regardless of their background or where they're from. You know, it's insane. And the fact that they don't give up on it, it doesn't, I'm not even sure if it's sane sometimes. There's not even a reason. Sometimes just let it go, but they don't. And that's the amazing thing. That never say die attitude is so unique to Irish drifting. And I hope it's something we never lose. Yeah, it was tough. First first lap in the, in the wet. Um, obviously I crashed the first corner the first, in the first battle. So didn't know what the track was going to be like, uh, but also the car just, it just wasn't right. Um, look, thanks a million to everybody that helped. You know, at a race meeting, if you crash, it's nobody's really going to come and help you. They lend you a wishbone or something, that might be the, the, the most of it. But they're certainly not going to be crawling underneath the car and doing everything that the lads were doing here. So the Shanahan's crew came up and gave a big hand. This man here, I'm not sure of his name, he gave me a big hand as well, the welder and everything, and I'm sure we'll get it fixed and get back out. Nice, no, 30 seconds there. 30 seconds. I'm pretty sure everybody in the tower, me included, said that's the end of that. That car ain't coming back out on track, not a hope. And now we're back onto the track and, you know, it wasn't the easiest weekend for him, but I think he learned a lot about the true spirit of the sport that weekend. John O'Hare gets the win and goes through as we predicted. the way to that car back 
Jacob again across the circuit. Contact of Barca goes into Pete and it's... Late dive by Rogers and look at this, Rogers may be not able to all take the back bumper off Paul McCarthy's car and they stay in it Eddie, the fight is on here. Fought to the floor as they come down into the roundabout section, can they slow it down? Absolutely they can. No contact on entry, wheel to wheel, Shannon and Evans make contact but they're keeping in it here. So after an absolutely incredible top 16, we were down to the final four. Two semi-finals, last battles of the year and the championship still on the line. Two Shanahan's in there, Connor Shanahan was going up against John O'Hare. Now John O'Hare, you know, phenomenal guy, hasn't had the best luck on track. And it was the last event and he was flying. He wasn't putting a foot wrong. He'd taken down some of the biggest stars in the game. And now he's going up against Connor Shannon. And as they went to that battle, Connor Shannon's car breaks. Um, it happens and just as he looks like he's the man to take the whole event he's in the pits with the timer counting down for five minutes with you know an unknown problem and a big panic for the Shannon team to try and get that car back out now with Jack's car with steering issues they've one team to try and manage two cars but in true Irish spirit they did they had the entire pit area under both cars trying to get those boys back out again and you couldn't take your eyes off <laughs> Connor Shannon now trying to make sure he makes that clock. It doesn't look good at the moment, not in the car with 30 seconds left to go. Yeah, shaking ahead from Connor Shannon, hands on the hips and a uh, hook from Mom Valerie. You know what, despite everything, he's had a fantastic season and a fantastic campaign. And that clock just ticks away. Three, two, one. Guys, give him a round of applause. Connor Shanahan, beaten wow. by the five minute rule, beaten by mechanical issues. A hook there from good friend, Shay Rogers. So Alan Hines is in Dwayne McKeever's car. He's going up against Jack Shanahan. And basically Alan Hines has to beat Jack Shanahan and win the event. If he does anything less, he can't win the championship. And if he does anything less, Jack wins the championship. 
that's how much was on the line. The two championship contenders were going to go head to head. And it was the most important battle of the year. The championship was very much in the balance. And you could sense that tension and nerves in the pits. Alan takes down Jack. I mean, nobody would have predicted that in a car he'd never driven before in, you know, the most difficult of circumstances. He's going to the final. He has a shot at this. And Jack, well, he's got to go back into the pits. He's with his family. It's all in Alan's hands now. The whole championship is in his hands. And the only man standing in Alan Hines' way is John O'Hare. John O'Hare, you know, who had been given a 50 to 1 to be in that position. Uh, now stands in the greatest position of his drift career. I think the whole crowd, I think we were even in the tower just like, imagine saying at the start of that event that you would have John O'Hare versus Alan Hines and Dwayne McKeever's car as your final battle of the year. I think everybody in Irish drifting held their breath for that one. Alan Hines actually rang the tower looking for cars, looking for anyone to give him a car, and nobody had a car in the country to give Alan Hines except the man going for the championship in Europe tomorrow. That is how much Dwayne McKeever wanted to see Alan Hines get a fair fight. He's been in the position before. Dwayne McKeever has borrowed many a car to stay in a championship. He knows what that feeling is like. And when the shoe is on the other foot, he stood up this morning and said, take my car, it's ready to go. It's the magnitude of the moment, the story to do that. I think it's just an absolute credit to him, but we are good. Here is the final. Thumbs up, here we are, Alan Hines to take on John O'Hare, they leave the line, slam through the gears, third, fourth, 80 miles an hour, sideways onto the wall, here comes John O'Hare, he's not backing down, Alan Hines keeping off those walls, keeping that car safe, he's going to have to do it without going to the wall, oh, but he oh, shuts down, Alan Hines shuts down, Alan oh. Hines shuts down, 10 to 0 advantage. He gets out of the car, there's a problem with the car. Get your ask for fucking five. I don't ask for five. Ask for five. Oh, he can't take it. We won't fix this, Richie. It doesn't matter. He's already lost it. He's got second. All right. Okay. No problem. The championship is so close, but it just wasn't meant to be. He he drove another person's car incredibly well. He battled through the grid, but the car let him down. And you know he was. It was bittersweet for Alan, I think. One, he was happy to be in the position he was in, even fighting for it after the morning he'd had. But he was so close. And that would award Jack Shannon the championship. And Jack was a deserved winner. He did everything. They, neither of them had a perfect day. But the man that did have a perfect day was John O'Hare. The stars aligned and it showed that drifting, no matter you know how much you try and give up or say that it's stacked against you, if you keep trying and you keep you know being positive about it, you'll have your day. I met Jono at my first ever drift event and he was a mechanic for Shane O'Sullivan, somebody that used to be in the championship last year. And he was only a mechanic then and I was only starting off as filming. We kind of gone through this journey almost together. And on the last event we were both at, it was almost incredible to see this person that you only saw in the pits, didn't even know drove, 
to win a pro level event and if that doesn't inspire you then i'm not sure what will as the dust settled and you know we packed up for the last time in jack fest uh, it was definitely emotional it was a different feeling this season had absolutely everything you could want from a drift season it had the drama the unpredictability the weather conditions the ups the downs you know the friendships the enemies the rivalries the partnerships it had everything but it was an emotional one because we had to announce that we were leaving but the positives i take from it and i was definitely more positive after jaff fest than anything the relief of not being in charge anymore it had sort of reignited my love for the sport the first time i think instead of looking forward you're constantly looking forward and i think over those 6 years we took very little time to look back it brought back all those emotions of why i fell in love with the sport in the first place um i love seeing drivers come from nowhere to become superstars i love seeing the underdog come through i love to see guys regular normal 9 to 5 working guys you know signing autographs out there being superstars heroes for the weekend it is the most fun you can have in a car it's hanging out with your friends at the weekend it's being there with like-minded people and with people from all different generations and walks of life and i've made lifelong friends that are drifting and i'm sure everybody on that grid has too and for me i'm super proud of everything we've achieved over those years i think we've we've done everything we could do sure we've made mistakes sure we've tried things that didn't work but for the most part i'm very proud of what we've achieved so proud of the team the drivers the media the fans everybody that's played their part and believe me every part was important I'm still the biggest fan of drifting. I still watch every event. I still build drift cars. I still love it exactly the same. I just want to love it from a different side now. I want to experience what those drivers are experiencing. I want to experience what those fans are experiencing. And I hope that the lessons learned from this year are that, you know, we got to pull together. We got to stay together. The world doesn't like drifting. It's getting harder and harder for drifting. Environmentalists want to kill it. Financial reasons, insurance reasons want to kill it. it needs a strong community behind it and if you have that strong community behind it anything is possible and people can't doubt that cuz look what we did and for me i will take my little bit of history my little legacy and you know i'll always have that i'll have those photos i'll have those videos uh we did something very special but for now i want to enjoy it i want to take a small rest i want to take a little break uh from being so so you know under pressure um, and i want to get and enjoy the sport that we all love and there's so much to love about it